Good morning, America, for our viewers in the West. Sean Diddy Combs arrested. Breaking overnight, Diddy taken into custody in New York after being indicted by a federal grand jury. What we know about the case against the rapper and producer who faced a series of allegations of sexual misconduct. Overnight, Donald Trump speaks about the assassination attempt at his golf course for the first time. Secret Service knew immediately it was bullets and uh, they grabbed me. Body camera video shows the moment the officers arrested the suspect. Keep walking! As we learn new details about what happened, the Trump donor who is with him on the golf course joins us this morning. Life-threatening flash flooding. State of emergency declared. Historic rain slamming the Carolinas. The chief just fell into the bridge right here, guys. Putting roads and neighborhoods underwater. Ginger is tracking the storm. Pipeline explosion forcing residents to flee in suburban Houston. Thousands losing power in the near triple digit heat as authorities search for the driver who hit the valve that ignited the inferno. Clocking your sleep with 1 billion people worldwide impacted by apnea. Now the FDA clearing a new sleep apnea feature for Apple watches. Apple giving GMA exclusive early access to see how it works. Deep sea disaster. One of the Titan submersible crew's last messages as former employees testify about concerns before the doomed voyage. Now, could there be criminal charges? Instagram game changer. The platform launching new protections for teens with parents as the guide. The CEO joins us live in a GMA exclusive. Working nine to five. And Jason Kelsey working overtime at his new nine to five. Are you ready? Monday night football, baby! Returning to his home turf in Philly for a thrilling battle of the birds. But the Falcons stunning Kelsey's Eagles with a last minute drive. Touchdown, Drake London! And you guessed it, Dolly Parton joins us live. What a way to make a living. Live in Times Square, this is Good Morning America. Good morning, America. It's always a good day when Dolly Parton mm. shows up. Love it. I cannot wait for that. And her yeah, sister's going to be with us, her, with yeah. us as well, Rachel. Yeah, we yeah. have a lot coming up today, including Chris and Dana Reeve's children. They're going to be here live, including our friend and colleague, Will Reeve, with their family's powerful story. It is powerful. We're going to begin, though, with the breaking news overnight. Sean Diddy Combs arrested in Manhattan after a grand jury indictment. Our senior investigative cor correspondent, Aaron Katursky, is at the courthouse and has the latest. Good morning to you, Aaron. Good morning, Robin. Sean Combs spent the night in federal custody after he was arrested on a three-count federal indictment charging him with racketeering conspiracy, sex trafficking by force, and prostitution. Federal prosecutors here said Combs abused, threatened, and coerced women and others around him to fulfill his sexual desires, protect his reputation, and conceal his conduct. Hip-hop mogul Sean Diddy Combs seen here just hours before his arrest in Manhattan last night taking pictures with fans. Federal agents with Homeland Security Investigations later taking him into custody at a hotel in Midtown following a nearly year-long investigation into human trafficking. Diddy's attorney says we are disappointed with the decision to pursue what we believe is an unjust prosecution. Diddy has been under criminal investigation since his former girlfriend, Cassie Ventura, accused him in a civil lawsuit of sexual and physical abuse. CNN obtained this disturbing hotel surveillance video from 2016, purportedly showing Combs attacking her, throwing her to the ground, kicking her, and trying to drag her away. The lawsuit was settled with no admission of wrongdoing, Combs issuing an apology video. I mean, I hit rock bottom, but I made no excuses. My behavior on that video is inexcusable. Ten more civil lawsuits followed Cassie's alleging sexual assault, physical violence, and human trafficking. His accusers paint a dark picture of a sexual deviant who preyed on young women and men looking to make it in the industry, plied them with drugs and alcohol, and forced them into sex acts, all of which Combs has denied. The criminal investigation spilled into public view last March when HSI agents raided Diddy's homes in Los Angeles and Miami. Stimulate your mind, strengthen your spirit. He shot to fame in the 1990s, launching the label Bad Boy Records and the successful careers of Mary J. Blige, Usher, and Notorious B.I.G. Expanding his brand and empire into fashion, fragrances, and alcohol. But much of that is now gone as his legal challenges mounted. 
His lawyer calling Combs a music icon, self-made entrepreneur, loving family man, and proven philanthropist who has spent the last 30 years building an empire, adoring his children, and working to uplift the black community. He is an imperfect person, but he is not a criminal. Did he knew this was coming, George? His attorney said he came here to New York two weeks ago anticipating the federal charges. George. Turski, thanks. Now to the assassination attempt on former President Trump at one of his golf courses in Florida. Trump spoke about it overnight after the suspect appeared in court for the first time. Rachel Scott is in West Palm Beach with the latest on the investigation. Good morning, Rachel. George, we are learning new details this morning. Officials say this is where the suspect was camped out for nearly 12 hours in those bushes. Just over those hedges is the golf course. A Secret Service agent just one hole ahead spotting the barrel of a rifle sticking out. Keep walking! Overnight, new body camera video showing the moment officers arrested the 58-year-old man they say camped out on Donald Trump's golf course for 12 hours, allegedly trying to assassinate him. What's your name, Austin? Ryan. Ryan? Trump was moving across the fairway near the fifth hole, a Secret Service agent yelling out, gun, spotting a barrel of a rifle sticking out from the fence. All of a sudden, we heard shots being fired in the air and I guess probably four or five, and it sounded like bullets, but what do I know about that? But Secret Service knew immediately it was bullets, and uh, they grabbed me. The former president recounting it all during an online conversation on the platform X, formerly known as Twitter. I was with an agent, and the agent did a fantastic job. Secret Service immediately surrounding Trump and taking him to a safe location. Sources say agents fired four to six rounds. The subject who did not have line of sight to the former president fled the scene. He did not fire or get off any shots at our agent. With reports of gunfire, the former president's close protection detail immediately evacuated the president to a safe location. That suspect, Ryan Ralph, taking off on foot, jumping into a black Nissan SUV. A witness spotting him driving off, taking a picture of the license plate number and alerting police. He was smart. He was just driving with the flow of traffic. Yeah, I think that uh, he may have thought he got away with it. 45 minutes later, police tracked down the suspect traveling northbound on I-95. Driver, take two steps to your right. You can see him exiting the vehicle, taken into custody, appearing in court Monday facing two felony gun charges. Authorities say he had a loaded SKS, a Soviet-style semi-automatic rifle with scope, a digital camera, a backpack, and a bag containing food. This is now the second attempt on the former president's life in just nine weeks, raising serious questions about how an armed man was able to get within 400 yards of Trump under heightened security protocol. The acting director of the Secret Service admitting that his agents did not search the perimeter of the golf course, explaining that the president wasn't even really supposed to go there. Was the golf course searched thoroughly before the former president's arrival? So at this time, I uh, it was an off-the-record movement, meaning it was not on the former president's official schedule. And was there any evidence to suggest that the suspect knew that Donald Trump was going to be on that golf course at that time? Based on what I know now, and it's an active investigation, I don't have any information at, uh, on that. The Secret Service promising the highest levels of protection for the former president. Trump and President Biden speaking by phone. It was very nice today. He called up to make sure I was okay, to make sure that, uh, you know, was, do I have any suggestions? but Trump blaming his political opponents. Still Democrats, from President Biden to Vice President Kamala Harris, were quick to condemn political violence. Let me just say, there is no, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, those of you who know me, many of you do, no place in political violence for political violence in America. None, zero, never. FBI officials have been on the scene. Officials have blocked off this road. They say this is the area where the suspect ran out of those bushes, attempted to flee, getting inside of that vehicle. As for former President Donald Trump, well, he is back out on the campaign trail today. He has a town hall in Michigan. He has a rally in New York tomorrow. The former president keeping with that busy campaign schedule. You heard from the acting director of the Secret Service insisting that he has the highest levels of protection. Michael. All right, Rachel, thank you so much for that. And the Secret Service is under scrutiny with questions being raised about whether the agency is doing enough to keep the former president safe. Our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, has more. Good morning, Pierre. Michael, good morning. With two potential assassination attempts in nine weeks in such a challenging threat environment, the Secret Service is under its most intense pressure in decades.
Our folks are rising to this moment. This morning, the U.S. government is facing a critical question and perhaps the most dangerous threat environment since 9-11. Does the Secret Service have enough? With this blunt assessment from President Biden. Service needs more help. Biden calling on Congress to do more as the agency deals with the threat of domestic terror, a surge in threats of political violence, and a resurgence of ISIS and al-Qaeda in the wake of the Israeli-Hamas conflict. I think the Congress should respond to their needs if they, in fact, need more services. In the wake of security failures in the attack against Trump at that Pennsylvania rally, the Secret Service has expanded Trump's SWAT team and made other security enhancements, but the congressional scrutiny remains intense. If the Secret Service is in need of more resources, we are prepared to providing it for them, possibly in the upcoming funding agreement. Even with bipartisan calls to give the Secret Service what it needs, the political environment is heated. President Trump on Monday was blaming the Biden administration for the recent plots against him. Acting Secret Service director tried to calm the political waters, saying the White House is trying to give him everything he needs. President Biden made it clear that he wanted the highest levels of protection for former President Trump. The cold hard fact is with so many threats and so many unstable people with access to guns and other weapons, there's virtually no margin for error, especially down the stretch of an election year in such a toxic political environment, Robin. All right, PR, thanks to you for your reporting. Now to the life-threatening flash flooding in the Carolinas. Let's go to Faith Abube at Carolina Beach in North Carolina with the impact of this historic rain. Good morning to you, Faith. Yeah, good morning to you, Robin. The Carolina Beach area is still under a state of emergency. We're told more than 60 people have been rescued so far, and you can see why. The water is starting to recede, but there are multiple vehicles that are stalled or flooded along this roadway. We are seeing a lot of water still left to go. There are also lawn chairs, picnic tables, garbage bins that have been washed into the roadways. Some of these neighbors had about four feet of water on their property at one point yesterday, and now they have a lot of cleanup left to do. This morning, life-threatening flash flooding from a powerful, slow-moving system, dumping more than a foot and a half of rain on parts of the Carolinas. Authorities declaring a state of emergency for Carolina Beach, just south of Wilmington. AccuWeather storm chasers in Southport finding submerged cars and a bridge overwhelmed by surging floodwaters. Oh, my gosh. Oh, this bridge is collapsing right here, and this truck just... The Jeep just fell into the bridge right here, guys. Across the state, some homeowners like Hunter Varnon stunned by the speed of it all. I've seen a lot of hurricanes, but I've never seen the water stack up this high this fast. We spoke to drivers who've been stuck on Highway 17 for hours, every few minutes running into sections like this that are flooded or flat out impassable. I'm going to try to make it home. I want to do that. Yeah, and Michael, there is a house just behind me around the corner where the garage is still flooded this morning. It's going to be interesting to see how the neighbors get out of there. There are also multiple roads across this area that have been closed. Officials say they're still doing damage assessment. In the meantime, though, the National Weather Service says the amount of rain that this area got in just a 12 hour period on average only happens once every 1000 years. Michael. Wow, it says a lot there, Faith. Thank you so much for that. Let's bring in Ginger, where millions are on alert um, as the storm moves north, Ginger. And what's amazing is this is not categorized as a tropical storm, so it ends up making it in the top five non-tropical storm totals. If they got up to 19 inches, which gets verified once they get into it, that's where they'll land. So this is a big one, especially and you can see where those rain totals, because this is the radar estimates, were focused there from Cape Fear back to the north and west. It was Boiling Springs Lakes. Uh, but look how far four to six inches fell just south of Raleigh. That's up to a half foot, and it did all fall in just a matter of a couple of hours. So that's where the problem is, is this is still quite slow moving. We have that low pressure system just now making it over the state line in to North Carolina. It'll keep pulling onshore flow, so you could have waves up to eight feet, certainly erosion all the way up through the Mid-Atlantic, Delmarva Peninsula. You've got coastal flood alerts that go for Rehoboth Beach, Atlantic City, uh, back into parts of Virginia. But watch the timing here because it's also going to come, some of these heavy showers, with a lot of gusty winds, like 20 to 30 mile per hour winds. So it's going to be super blustery. Washington, D.C., not a great day to be outdoors or running around. Atlantic City, look at 
that's 730 tomorrow morning, 31 mile per hour gusts could be with you. So that's going to pull all of that on shore. And if you see some of those uh, rain totals, now it's more like two to four inches, but that falls fast. You can easily flood out a road. So we're going to be watching this for the next 24 to 36 hours. We could get some showers by Thursday. Mm. Okay, thank you, Ginger. We move on now to Monday Night Football in a thriller in Philadelphia with the Falcons pulling off a last minute upset against the Eagles. Janae Norman here with the highlights. Good morning, Janae. George, good morning. I know you, like me, was on the end of, edge of your seat for this game. This was a crucial first win for the Falcons and Kirk Cousins, who saved the best for last as they eked out a win with 34 seconds left in the game. This morning, an overnight thriller. Monday Night Football coming down to a fourth quarter dramatic ending. The Eagles' Saquon Barkley dropping this pass. Barkley dropped it. The Manning's reactions sang it all. I no! Oh! Philly settling for a field goal and with a score of 21 15, giving Kirk Cousins and the Falcons an opening, flying down the field with 80 seconds left on the clock. Cousins looks right. Has a man! Touchdown, Drake London. Scoring the winning touchdown, Atlanta's defense holding strong, forcing Jalen Hurts to cough up a rare interception to close the game. Intercepted, picked up by Jesse Bates. Players celebrating in the Falcons' locker room. And off the field, former Eagle Jason Kelsey going 2-0 against a suit. After forgetting his suit for a second week in a row, his former coach right. stepped in to help. I got countdown, and I don't have anything to wear. Your family, I got the perfect thing. Donning the eagle green South Philly tuxedo in the pre-show, showing off his dance moves, <laughs> and hyping up the hometown crowd. Are you ready for Monday Night Football, baby? No, I wish I would have stuck around and gone to that Phillies game for the Eagles. They are feeling the impacts of receiver A.J. Brown being sidelined with a hamstring injury. They looked like they could have pulled this one, put this one to bed until Cousins got it together at the end, leaving them with a brutal loss. How was that, Michael? You think I could be a football analyst or something? Well, you got the Eagles green on. So <laughs> right? Could you be the analyst? That was very good, by the way. Very good. That was nice. Well done. Thank you. I Keep your day it. job. <laughs> I knew it was coming. I knew something was coming. But it was surprising, though, the end. Yeah, it was surprising. Yeah. Did Atlanta you have the Falcons down. winning? Dude, I, I had the Eagles winning. I thought the Eagles were going to win. I did, too. We have this new thing on Weekend GMA, who's with Herm, and we all picked the Eagles. Geo just copied us. Who's, you know what? What? Who's with Herm? Herm Edwards. Oh, Herm. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, if everybody picked the same team, that team loses. That's one thing I learned. That's I'm just that saying. Happened. I'm just saying. They're pointing at me to talk on this camera right now. Janae, I'd love to discuss more football with you, but coming up here on GMA, we have an exclusive with the CEO of Instagram announcing a new plan to help keep teens safe on the platform. And Rupert Murdoch battling three of his children in court over control of his empire. And the investigation into the deadly explosion of the Titan submersible. The former employees who say they shared their safety concerns before the doomed voyage. What's cooking good looking on this Tuesday morning? The one and only Dolly Parton and her sister Rachel joining us live with their new cookbook. We'll be right back. Welcome back to GMA. Dolly Parton can do it all, including cook. She joins us with her sister Rachel. Tell us about some of the recipes in their new cookbook, and that's coming up right here on TMA. Always a delight mm -hmm. when we hear it, from it Dolly. It sure Martin. is. Following a lot of headlines right now. Doing the latest on the breaking news overnight, Sean Diddy Combs was arrested in Manhattan after a grand jury indictment. Combs was taken into custody at a hotel in Midtown Manhattan following a nearly year-long investigation into human trafficking. He spent the night in custody, due in court later this morning. Also right now, pipeline explosion shot a column of fire over suburban Houston. Residents were forced to evacuate as first responders fought to prevent the blaze from spreading to nearby homes. Thousands lost power in the, in the near triple-digit heat as authorities searched for the driver who hit the valve that ignited the inferno. Also, American gymnast Jordan Child filed an appeal of the ruling that stripped her of a bronze medal in the floor exercise at the Paris Olympics. Her appeal to the, to the Supreme Court of Switzerland seeks to reverse the decision that upheld her fifth place finish. The court is expected to rule in a few months. And Apple just announced FDA clearance for a software feature in the Apple Watch to help identify patterns of breathing disturbances that can help lead to a severe sleep apnea diagnosis. And coming up later, our Becky Worley got an exclusive look at the new sleep apnea feature on the Apple Watch. 
and she will show us how it all cool. works. Yeah. It can really help some yeah. people, save some people. And we've got a lot more ahead, including an exclusive with the CEO of Instagram with an announcement for teens and parents. That is all coming up, Robin. But right now, Michael, new details about the Titan submersible tragedy that resulted in the death of five people. A Coast Guard hearing revealed the craft's final message and new accusations about safety concerns before the doomed trip to the Titanic began. Our transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez, is in Washington for us. Good morning to you, Gio. Hey, Robin, good morning. These are all new serious allegations of ignored warnings. And this morning here, as you mentioned, the final messages from the Titan. The big question, did the passengers on board know that they were in trouble? This morning, investigators sharing this new photo of the Titan submersible, the tail cone sticking up in the sand at the bottom of the Atlantic, about 300 yards from the wreckage of the Titanic. Did you feel a sense of uh, urgency or being rushed to get to operations, to start operations? Was there pressure? Oh, 100%. A Coast Guard hearing now revealing haunting new details about the doomed vessel that catastrophically imploded in the Atlantic last summer, killing all five people on board and sparking a search and recovery mission that captivated the world. As investigators try to piece together what went wrong, we're learning that the crew was in touch with their support ship, the Polar Prince, via text message. One of the last messages to the surface from two miles down, all good here. Half an hour later, this dropped two weights, potentially indicating a crisis on board. Dropping the weights may have been a last ditch effort to bring the Titan back to the surface. Former employees testifying about concerns before that tragic dive. Among them, OceanGate's former engineering director, Tony Nissen, who says he was kept in the dark and didn't originally know that their mission was to reach the Titanic. And why did you depart the company? Got fired. When did you get fired? June 2019. Because it wouldn't let him go to the Titanic. The hearing revealing more than 100 equipment issues in the past several years, Nissen saying the Titan was also struck by lightning in 2018 and was left outside in the bitter Canadian cold for seven months. It was never pressure tested to the highest industry standards, and it even partially sank four weeks before the doomed mission following a night of high seas and fog. Nissen adding he clashed with the Ocean Gate CEO who died in the implosion, Stockton Rush. Nissen says Rush was often concerned with costs and schedules. Jules. Stockton's and my relationship started to turn sour. As everything was built, he wanted me to be the pilot that runs the um, Titanic missions. And I told him I'm not getting in it. In this YouTube video, Rush described himself as a maverick. And, you know, I've broken some rules to make this. I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me. The carbon fiber and titanium, there's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. And the hearings will go on for another two weeks, possibly even longer. The whole goal here, Robin, is to make sure that something like this never happens again. But what are, are there other goals here with these hearings, though, Gio? Could they lead to criminal referral? Absolutely. This could absolutely lead to criminal charges, Robin. In fact, we're hearing that after the hearings, the Coast Guard may make some recommendations over to the Department of Justice. So we're going to be watching that very closely because, as you just saw, we are dealing with some very serious allegations here. We certainly are. Gio, our thanks to you. George? Okay, Robin, now to the real-life succession battle playing out in a Nevada courtroom. Rupert Murdoch is fighting to change his family trust so that his eldest son gets control of his media empire. Eva Pilgrim here with the details. Good morning, Eva. Good morning, George. Control of the empire is not a decision Rupert Murdoch can make by himself because of that trust he created for his children. Right now, there are seven days of evidentiary hearings scheduled as a court will decide what happens next. The fight over power and control of one of the world's most powerful media companies playing out like an episode in the hit show Succession. Everything I've done in my life, I've done for my children. Control over Rupert Murdoch's media empire now to be decided. Any comment, Mr. Murdoch? By the secrecy in the case. Not by him, but in a Reno, Nevada courtroom. The 93-year-old tycoon wanting to protect the conservative leanings of his media portfolio, which includes Fox News, The Wall Street Journal, and New York Post, is now trying to change the terms of an irrevocable family trust. I'm the youngest boy! In changing an irrevocable trust, you even need to get 
all of the current and future beneficiaries to agree to that modification. The trust was created after Murdoch's divorce from his second wife, giving equal control of his company to his four children at the time. But the New York Times reporting that the family fell out over political disagreements after Murdoch and his oldest son, Lachlan, allegedly pushed Fox News further to the right when Donald Trump was president. In 2019, Murdoch put Lachlan in charge of the empire, and now the mogul trying to change the trust to keep him in charge, arguing in court that the only way to preserve the company and protect its value is by giving Lachlan veto power so his more moderate siblings can't challenge his vision. All four would maintain equal shares and financial equity. The New York Times reporting Bill Barr, former attorney general under President Trump, is leading the effort to rewrite the trust. James, Elizabeth, and Prudence Murdoch fighting the move as a united front, hiring high-powered attorneys to challenge their father's move in court. So this should wrap up next Tuesday. Then the probate commissioner will have 14 days to determine whether or not Murdoch can alter the trust and give his son Lachlan full control of the media empire. I mean, everyone's anticipating there will be appeal, so it's, it's nowhere near over. Far from over. Yes. Far from over. Fascinating, though. Everyone's watching. Family dynamics. All right. Thank you so much for that, Eva. Now with a GMA exclusive. This morning, Instagram is launching new protections for teens, a potential game changer for parents. It's impacting tens of millions of teens accounts. CEO Adam Mazzari joins us with the announcement and what parents should know. Adam, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And this new experience is called Teen Accounts, where people under 18 are automatically placed into these accounts, and users under 16, they're going to need their parents' permission to change any of these settings. So tell us, how does this work? That's exactly right. They're an automatic set of protections for teens that try and proactively address the top concerns that we've heard from parents about teens online. Things like who can contact them, what content they see, and how much time they spend on their device. And we've built things like making sure these are all private by default, there's restrictions on who can message your teen, there's content restrictions so that they see less inappropriate content, and even a reminder to leave Instagram once you hit an hour for the day, all without requiring any involvement from the parent. Well, it definitely seems like, like a game changer. Seems like it puts the parents in more control or in control. But how, how you know, you have some calf, crafty kids out there. How are you preventing these kids from lying about their age to get around these features? It's a great question. Now, we're starting by rolling this out automatically to the tens of millions of teens that have already told us they are teens. But we know that teens try to work around restrictions from time to time, so we've worked on ways to protect against that. Things like requiring a teen to verify their age if they try to change their birthday. Things like not allowing someone to create a new account with a different birthday on the same device. Mm. And we're working on ways to automatically detect those who might be lying about their age and then bring protections to those accounts as well. You know, a lot has been said, including there have been lawsuits filed regarding social media's role in the safety and mental health of young teens. So what responsibility do you think Instagram has? I think we have a responsibility to make sure that Instagram is a safe place for teens to explore their interests and connect with their friends. But this change is really focused not on any litigations, but on parental concerns. We've really decided that parents should be our North Star. They've been clear on what they are most concerned about, and we're trying to proactively address those concerns without requiring their involvement. But if a parent wants to get involved, we've also built some robust tools to allow them to shape the experience into what's most appropriate for their teen. Because at the end of the day, a parent always knows what's best for their child. And I'm sure there are a lot of parents interested in this. And so for those parents who are at home right now watching our program, how can they check these settings on their phone and, and make these changes? So we're going to start rolling this out proactively this week, and it will be out to the entire country within 60 days. Your teen will actually see when they open up Instagram a message explaining exactly what's going on. And if they want to change any of the settings to a less restrictive setting and they're under 16, they're going to need your permission to do so. And they can proactively outreach to you via the app. Or you can actually go to your profile settings and then to supervision tools and proactively turn on parental control if you so choose. All right, actually pretty simple. So, Mr. Mazzari, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I really appreciate your time explaining this to us. And I think the parents are very interested in your new product. Thank you.
Now with our play of the day, Janae is showing us baby pictures. Don't want to hear the commentary from my <laughs> friend Henry. <laughs> All knows. Beautiful baby. But you go from talking about a football game and now something with a lot of football fields involved here? Yes, basically. Okay. A okay. very daring balancing act, which is like being up here with you guys trying to work while showing you baby <laughs> pictures. This one connecting two continents. Take a look at slackline athlete John Roos attempting to cross a rope between Europe and Asia, a distance of over 1,174 yards. That's over 11 football fields. Uh, I did the uh, math okay. myself. No, I didn't. That is across the Bosphorus Strait in Istanbul, Turkey, and at a height of over 540 mm. feet. The Ooh. rope sags in the middle, making the crossing extra dangerous, but eventually, Roos achieves his goal, becoming the first person ever to do so. And he says that he has a fear of heights but that fear is necessary. It helps him improve his technique and stay oh, safe. If you have a fear of heights, wouldn't you just stay on the ground? Right? It seems like a lot easier way wow. to manage things, but he did Congratulations it. to him, though. Congratulations That's to him. Impressive. Yeah, right? George, you, you get your own show. <laughs> 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 Coming up here on GMA, thank you, Janae, as always. You always bring it. You always bring it. Coming up, the new documentary about Christopher Reeve and his family. His children, you see them there. Oh, my gosh, including Aww. our Will Reeve, his sister, Alexandra, Matthew, his brother. We're going to talk about it when we come back. Good morning, America. It's 8 a.m. The friend who was with Donald Trump on the golf course joins us this morning, speaking about the apparent assassination attempt. Clocking your sleep. The FDA clearing a new sleep apnea feature for Apple Watches. Apple giving GMA exclusive early access to see how it works. Superman on screen and off. The new documentary about Christopher and Dana Reeve. Their journey after his devastating accident and her cancer diagnosis. I thought, how much can one little soul bear? How the Reeve children supported each other after their deaths. Will, Alexandra, and Matthew are here with rarely seen home videos telling their family's inspiring story. Country legend Dolly Parton and her sister Rachel sharing stories and recipes from their new cookbook. Watch me dance, dance the night away. Oh! Are y'all ready to get on the dance? Yeah, you know it. Ooh. Dancing with the Stars gears up for season 33 tonight. And the cast is saying... Good morning, America! Live in Times Square, this is GMA. We hope you're doing well this Tuesday morning. Good morning to all of you there at home. And we are here in the studio today with the Reeve siblings, mm -hmm. Will, Alexandra, and Matthew. The new documentary, Superman, is about their father, Christopher Reeve's life before and after his accident and how the actor turned advocate became a real life hero. That is coming up. Looking forward to talking to them. But first, we have a look at the top stories breaking at eight, starting with the latest on the alleged assassination attempt of Donald Trump. New body camera video shows the moment officers arrested the 58-year-old man who they say camped out on Trump's golf course for 12 hours. He appeared in court on Monday and currently faces two felony gun charges. A few moments ago, I spoke with Steve Witkoff, Donald Trump's friend, fellow real estate investor and donor, who was on the golf course with the former president on Sunday afternoon. Mr. Wickoff, thank you for joining us this morning. And could you take us through those moments and what happened when you heard the gunfire on the golf course? I was out, uh, Michael. Um, you're, I know you're a golfer, so, um, mm -hmm. so, so um, I was out on the fifth hole. Uh, we, were, we were having a great day. I played a lot of golf with the president over my, the course of my friendship with him. And we're on the fifth green, and I heard the first shot. I was, I don't know, maybe five or ten yards away from him. We were in a tight bunch group. I saw the Secret Service uh, do exactly what they're supposed to do, which was um, get right on top of the president and, and get in between the line of sight uh, where it was, where the gunshots were evidently coming from. And they did that job in an exemplary way. I watched in real time because I never really crouched. Um, and to this, to this you know, to this moment, I, I'm not sure why, really. Um, it was just, I was almost mesmerized by everything that was happening. But, um, and then in quick succession, there were four shots. And 
then the Secret Service was whisking him out of there, getting him back to the clubhouse as uh, he's the first priority, he's the protectee. And they were engaging in that corner on the sixth hole where evidently the, uh, the you, you know, this uh, would-be assassin had, um, had put himself, had created a sort of lair there. And you, and you mentioned the Secret Service did exactly what they're trained to do and covered the former president and whisked him off the course. Was anything said to you by the, by the former president throughout all of this? Well, first of all, I, I, I saw the president as, uh, as I, I mean, I don't know how many agents were on top of him. I mean, there were a whole bunch. Um, uh, but I saw him gesturing. I saw him looking over. It was clear to me, I've been around him for so long, and we really are very good friends. It was clear to me that he was, at that moment, looking around, because he knew he had friends out there, staffers who were civilians, and it was clear to me that he was, uh, he was just very concerned about everybody as he was being taken away. And of course, when we got back to the clubhouse, I didn't make it back until a few minutes after that. Uh, that's all that he was concerned about. Was with those who were with him. And um, another thing you revealed on X last night, that you're heavily involved with the former president, the new Trump crypto venture. But how, what is your role in that? And if he were elected, uh, would it be a conflict of interest for him to be involved when the government is charged with overseeing it? Well, first of all, uh, um, I think he believes in it for the, all the same reasons that I believe in it, which is the creating a a DeFi, this is a DeFi business, which is a decentralized finance business, and it's all about the democratization of credit. So our whole system, our whole country runs on the, the uh, availability of credit. And there are many who have been locked out of the marketplace, as I was when I first had a dream and wanted to be in the real estate business. And so uh, that's the reason we went into uh, this business. It's not a meme coin. It's not something uh, uh, in that category. It is a real deal business that you will see a lot more of in the coming years. And if the president is elected, which I expect him to be, then everything that he, uh, all of his, um, of his ownership, his businesses, will be put in some sort of a trust. His children, I would assume, will be involved in running it. And I doubt that, uh, therefore, that there is any conflict. Um, and he has no restrictions on what he can do before the election. Uh, what those what those issues are after the election are not really something that I'm that all, that I'm aware of. All right, Mr. Whitcoff, thank you. Thank you so much for explaining that to us, and thank you for joining us this morning and giving us your firsthand account of being there with the president when the second assassination attempt occurred. We appreciate your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, Michael. Now to the FDA officially clearing. The Apple Watch's sleep apnea detection feature, Becky Worley, got exclu exclusive access to try the new tech. Sleep is supposed to be peaceful, but for millions of Americans, it's anything but. The consequences of sleep apnea are endless. In addition to feeling tired and sleepy all the time, it's a huge risk factor for high blood pressure, stroke, heart attack, dementia, and mood disturbance. Medical sleep apnea tests need a doctor's prescription, can be pricey, and requires sleeping at a sleep center Night. or hooking up diagnostic equipment at home. But Apple just announcing FDA clearance for a software feature in the Apple Watch to help identify patterns of breathing disturbances suggestive of moderate to severe sleep apnea. To try it out, Apple giving us exclusive early access to the new watch. The watch has a motion detector called an accelerometer that's so sensitive that from your wrist, Apple says it can determine the pattern of your lungs inflating and deflating, and it logs when something disrupts that pattern. The watch has been monitoring my sleep for the last few nights, and when it comes to breathing disturbances, good news. It says they're not elevated. For FDA clearance, Apple tested the feature on roughly 1,400 people and then compared it against the gold standard medical sleep test. And Apple says the watch correctly alerted people who had apnea 66% of the time. And while it doesn't diagnose sleep apnea, it can indicate something is going on.
Other devices like the Aura Ring and Fitbit give warnings about apnea, and the Samsung Galaxy Watch has a similar FDA clearance, but with the Samsung Watch, you have to actively set up an apnea evaluation, while the Apple Watch does it automatically. The Apple Watch 9 and 10 and the Ultra 2 will work with this feature. The watch monitors you for a month before popping up any apnea alerts. And if you do get a notification, Apple says talk to your doctor, guys. Definitely do that, Becky. Thank you so much. And coming up in our GMA morning menu, our Will Reeve is here with his siblings, Alexandra and Matthew, telling us about the new documentary, Superman, and how their family supported each other, each other when their father, Christopher Reeve, was injured. Also ahead, Dancing with the Stars is back. The stars are getting ready right before tonight's big premiere. And Ava Menace is here with her new children's book. She also tells us what her kids thought of dad, Ryan Gosling, playing Ken. And Emily in Paris star Ashley Park is also here. It's all coming up on GMA. Back now with our GMA cover story, a closer look at the inspiring story of Christopher and Dana Reeve and their family. The new documentary, Superman, takes us inside their life before and after the catastrophic injury that left Christopher paralyzed. Our Will Reeve is here with his siblings, Alexandra and Matthew. But first, Diane Sawyer on Christopher's life and legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Reeve. It is 10 months after his shocking horseback riding accident. Christopher Reeve is at the Oscars with so many friends seeing him for the first time. Their supersonic Superman who can now travel only as fast as his wheelchair. What you probably don't know is that I left New York last September and I just arrived here this morning. <laughs> and I'm glad I did. Because I wouldn't have missed this kind of welcome for the world. Thank you. His fellow actors remember how he was once their impossibly handsome six foot four inch colleague. But he started out a skinny kid from New York. Here he is in the Superman screen test. He set out with ferocity to train his body. The point is that when I started, I was a string bean, and Superman's not a string bean. The thing that happens is that the stronger I get, the more it helps my mental attitude towards the part. And the string bean in that audition succeeded in becoming the muscular superhero who could save mankind. Now, a paralyzed man was still filled with superhuman hope that someday he could will himself to walk again. He created a foundation which has invested more than $140 million in research and has helped others to stand, to walk. It's all described in the upcoming documentary, Superman. But as the years go by, the miracles he sought for himself never came. His fingers moved slightly, he celebrates. He strains, struggles to make his legs move. And he works so hard to prove to the doctor he can breathe without a ventilator. I was hoping that we'd find uh, some response from the diaphragm when we stimulated the nerve. Uh, uh, we didn't. The doctor gives him bad news. I understand. OK, well, thank you. Eventually, surgery will help him breathe on his own a little, at times for hours a day. His older children from a previous relationship, Matthew and Alexandra, would spend hours sitting with him in his office. There were days where he was getting major setbacks, devastating medical news, you know, or changes on a policy fight that he was fighting and he had lost that battle. And he would let us see the hope and the disappointment and say, today is a really hard day. And then he would say, and we're going to go get dinner together, or well, let's go watch a movie. Like, he would see us, he would let us see him take that journey back up. Alexandra and I are both parents now. You can understand where that sort of extra level of determination and perseverance would, would come from. And day after day, he looked for ways to be the dad his little boy needs. Daddy's in his off-road vehicle. My dad taught me how to ride a bike. 
which is quite remarkable considering he wasn't able to move. How does it feel to be riding your bike, sir? Good. <laughs> and then, after nine valiant years in 2004, Christopher Reeve's body suddenly gives out. He falls into a coma. His wife, Dana, races to him. She came flying in, and she just yelled, I love you, I love you, over and over again, <laughs> making sure he could hear it. She was going to reach him. Certainly a part of her had just died in that moment as well. And I told him that I loved him. I would do whatever I could to make him proud. And then he was gone. I promised to love, honor, and cherish him till death did us part. Well, I can't do that because I will love honor and cherish him forever. Goodbye to you. And then 10 months after Christopher Reeve's death, the unimaginable. The mother who had held the family together with her light, her song, is diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Dana Reeve had never smoked. We talked about the wrenching moment she realized she had to give her 12-year-old son, Will, the news. And to then have to tell him, you know, that now I have cancer, it just, I thought, how much can one little soul bear? Dana Reeve arranges for Will to live with the family of his best friend. And then, after seven months fighting the cancer, she dies at the age of 44. Despite the love and security that my siblings provided me and my family provided me and my adoptive family provides me, that was the moment, March 6th, 2006, that was, I, I've been alone since then. With extraordinary love, his older siblings, Alexandra, who was then a law student, and Matthew, a producer, would drop everything in their lives when their little brother needed them. So in our interview, Will has a question he says he's never asked them before. Did you find it difficult that, did people worry enough about you? That like, <clears throat> it like wasn't the issue. <laughs> like, I don't think I've ever thought about that either. Like the job at hand was keeping things going, like keeping it, keeping us okay, keeping everyone okay, honoring them in the right way setting you up for success. I, I think our greatest focus and, and um, front of mind was, was you and I'm in awe or mm -hmm. awe of the both of you and um, how you've uh, you know, carried yourself and continue to carry yourself. And, um, yeah. A family like any other, teaching the rest of us about finding a path through loss to strength and love. Yesterday, you heard the lullaby Dana would sing to the family every night. This pretty planet. All through the night, safe till the morning light. Her song for a little boy, now all grown up. Now, as Uncle Will put their <laughs> kids to bed many times, and that's the song I sing to them. I remember the words. How could you not? There's a universal story in here, and it's not about a famous person in a cape and tights. It's about a family. It's a human story. We had human parents who did superhuman things. And their beautiful children, Matthew Reeve, Alexandra Reeve, Givens, and our Will Reeve, are here. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and watching you all as you're watching um, Diane's interview with you, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, each thank and every one of you. Uh, so beautiful, so powerful. Uh, such grace that you, that you continue to show. I understand that you all were together when you saw the first rough cut. Did that help being all together? What were your emotions watching it together? Yeah, 
Yeah, it was, I mean, it was, we were really lucky that we were able to all be in the same city because we live in different parts of the world. And it was, um, it was one of the highlights for me of this journey of doing this documentary was being able to sit there and, uh, and see it and watch this story and our home movies have been crafted in this incredibly well told cinematic way. Yeah. The bond between you all is so powerful. The movie is fantastic. Congratulations on that. Well, we see how emotional it was for you in the documentary, but you were so young mm. then. I imagine doing this, you must have learned a lot of things that you couldn't have known then. Right. I, I was born after the Superman of it all, and, and Matthew and Al were older than I was. So it was a real gift to be able to see all the stories that I had heard growing up put laid out cinematically and, and to fill in the blanks that I had for my dad and my mom and it was a gift and, and to Matthew's point about watching it all together it was such a relief to be with them because mm -hmm. I always feel so safe with my siblings yeah. but it was also a relief because the movie's really good <laughs> <laughs> we're sitting there going like oh thank god like, we're, we're proud of this one you should be <laughs> you, you should be very proud of Alexander we got a sense of what your family was like and the dynamic of your family through this documentary and, and before and after your father's um, accident how did that dynamic help you all deal with this well one of the things i love about this film is just watching the entirety of our dad's life and dana's life told i mean our dad was this amazing strong person who flew solo across the atlantic twice and had all of these hobbies that people don't even know about mm. and so to have that part of him captured but then after the accident when his definition of strength change so much. It was about being resilient, about being there as a parent, and having that story told and seeing some really good baby footage of Will. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite was the braces, actually. No, yeah. <laughs> George sent me a note going, the braces worked. <laughs> just like us, just like yeah. us. And it, it was so beautiful how you included Will's mother, Dana, who you yeah. all were very close, yeah. close with. And we saw in just the piece right there and how you we're talking about her too. Can I call her you Al as well? I know they call yeah, you Al. It's a family name. <laughs> okay. That you okay. Um, it was important. Yeah. It was important. She was the caregiver. She was the one, and I know you read um, a part of her diary that she yeah. left. But talk about the importance of making sure that she was included with the story. I, yeah, I mean, Dad's accent really pushed the marriage vows of in sickness and in health to the extreme. And Dana never wavered for a second. And she was the rock that the whole family. Uh, was built upon and I think gave him the strength to, to, to carry on as well as the, the three of us. Um, and you can't tell his story without her. Right. Now, a lot of people are going to be inspired by this story. Thank you for sharing it. All of you can see Superman, the Christopher Reeve story in select theaters on September 21st and 25th. For tickets, go to Fathom Events. I just got to say again, you guys, a beautiful family. Yep. A beautiful family. Thank you. You know about yeah. siblings. Well, Dolly Parton, this is what we call a segue. <laughs> Dolly Parton and her sister Rachel in the business. are going to join us live. Best in the business. Welcome back to GMA, live from Times Square. Back now, and do we have a treat for you? We are joined by a true legend, Dolly Parton, and her beautiful sister, Rachel Parton George, live, L I V E, live from Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> they have written a new cookbook together. It's called Good Looking Cooking. I love that. Oh my gosh, Dolly and Rachel, it is so great, so great. I love the title of that book, first of all. And just wonderful to see you both. We have these delicious dishes, some of them mm -hmm. from your book that are here in front of us. I wish people had smell of vision so they could really <laughs> get a sense of it. So Dolly, Dolly, tell us, um, tell us the reason why you all wanted to do this. Share these family recipes with everybody. Well, we love to cook, we love to eat, and of course we grew up with all these wonderful southern women cooking all this great food, although we have a few recipes that are not necessarily southern, but Rachel's a great cook, and she's kind of really like the star of the family as far as the cooking, and I thought, well, why don't we just write a cookbook and the old Hank Williams song of, hey, good looking, what you got cooking? <laughs> That's what everybody else we walked into the kitchen so we thought why don't we write a book together and we've had a wonderful time this is rachel by the way and i'm very proud of her Hi. good morning rachel well, so great to have you you're the youngest of dolly's siblings what memories can you share of cooking at home memories uh well we always were cooking uh 
breakfast, lunch, and, and dinner. <laughs> and um, I, I just love cooking. I love being in the kitchen, and I love the family around. So that's what I, I love. Because back growing up, we called it breakfast, dinner, supper. <laughs> but it's the same. <laughs> uh, supper time. I remember those days. And, you know, and, and you, we each picked our favorite dish out of the book. Mine was the barbecue ribs. That's what I'm saying. I love some good ribs. And these ribs go back, and these recipes go back to your childhood. But, Dolly, you said you learned to cook out of necessity. Well, we all did because we had a big old family. There's 12 of us kids, Rachel being the baby. But um, we just always had to cook and eat. We grew our own food, by the way. We were farmers, farmers' daughters, so to speak. But uh, we used to can our own food. So we actually uh, learned to cook early on because Mama was always having babies. And as the <laughs> girls started to grow up, took over the cooking. <laughs> that's it. I'm glad that you all did because, okay, you got the ribs. Uh, mac and cheese, yep. that's, that's George's. Ooh. Mine is, oh, I love the green beans, mm. the good old southern yeah. green beans. So it's, it's apparent that you both know your way around the kitchen, and you're both great on TV together. So I'm just going to say here, is there a cooking show? Is there a cooking show <laughs> oh. in the future for you two? Well, we've talked about it. You can take that one. <laughs> well, we have talked about it. We wanted to get the book up and released, and um, we have talked about it, and it could happen. Okay. If not, we can certainly do. <laughs> I think Rachel would be wonderful on a cooking show. Of course, I'm a little busy to do a, a full-time cooking show, <laughs> but I would certainly be a good guest on her show anytime she called me. <laughs> <on the book. laughs> you'd, always, you'd always be available for your baby sister. We know that about you, Dolly. <laughs> Yeah, and you always have a yeah. home here, both of you here at GMA. Okay, Lara, Lara. Oh, that bread. Banana, oh, banana pudding. pudding. Mm, pudding. We hear. Oh, oh, no. What's that? The banana pudding. pudding, especially this time of the morning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's really, that's really an uh, old family recipe that's been in the family for a long time, that recipe. Yes, there's two recipes in the book for banana pudding. One is Mama's recipe, and then I had to do the quick and easy recipe. <laughs> uh, and they're both great. Uh, you have which one? I don't you know have? which one you have. You have the one with they have the cookies, top? the full cookies, and the oh. full bananas. Okay, well, that's the good one. That's the, that's the <laughs> we, we have a feeling they're all good <laughs> recipes. And, and the crazy, the thing is, you two just don't cook together. You actually collaborated on some music Ooh. on Dolly, your new album that's coming out in November. So what can you tell us about the collaboration and the music? Well, actually, the album that's coming out is, is my family, my entire family, going all the way back. We've traced our history back to the 1800s. But anyway, Rachel's a wonderful singer-songwriter. <laughs> and so as one of the pieces in the album, it's called uh, Dolly Parton's Family, Smoky Mountain DNA. And on that particular album, Rachel and I do a song together that she wrote, a beautiful song. It's called, called I Will Know. And yeah. she's got the most beautiful voice, so you got to hear our, our, the stories of our family, and you'll especially love the one with Rachel for sure. Oh, my goodness. Well, you have a, a strong DNA when it comes to singing, when it comes to cooking, when it comes to looking good. <laughs> good looking cooking. Thank you both. Thank you, Dolly. Yep. Thank you, Rachel, so very much. Oh, and, thank you. And you Thanks get, for having us. This is the day of launching. We're launching our book today, so we feel like we're, this is a special celebration for us to get to be with all of you. So thank you for having us. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to see you, Dolly. And Rachel, it was wonderful meeting you. We've got to get you here to New York City yes. next time. Mm -hmm. All the best to both of you and your entire your entire families. And you can get these delicious recipes on GoodMorningAmerica.com. Check out Dolly and Rachel on the cover of the All Recipes Winner Entertaining Issue is online now. And as Dolly said, Good Looking Cooking is available now. And we're celebrating Emily in Paris all week. <laughs> and this morning, we're saying bonjour to Ashley Park, whose character Mindy takes center stage in part two of season four. Ashley, thank you so much for being here with us. We're so, we're so happy to have you Thank here. Thank you we, for having me. I love seeing you. Of course, of course. We love seeing you as well. You know, that we know that getting to season four
Mm. That was a challenge for you health wise, mm -hmm. um, which gave the show new meaning to you. I, I heard this year. It did. I think um, it's wild to watch it back and mm. um, know what I was going through. But I think sometimes the most challenging times in your life, when you persevere through it, become the most rewarding. But um, yeah, I, I was diagnosed with sepsis right before we started filming. I was a month late. Mm -hmm. um, it was just World Sepsis Day, and so just raising awareness that anyone could get it at any time. But um, it was a it was a big physical, mental struggle for me. But I think that I saw firsthand. I, I love when people come up and say, "Oh, this show, watching it, really lifted me out of like a hard time or a bad day or something." And um, I I experienced that firsthand, just having to show up to work and being in Mindy's shoes or stilettos or whatever. <laughs> and, um, and the the cast and crew, especially Lily Collins and Paul Foreman, them being with me and supportive. Mm -hmm. I think it being the fourth season, um, it really felt like a family who was there to support me. So I don't think I could have done it for any other show. Well, you know what? The show loves you. We love you. People love this show as well. <laughs> and we're going to take a look at a clip. Let's check it out. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, you, you, uh, yeah. I'm guessing we need the. No, it's okay. Here. I'll use your tie. <laughs> yeah, 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 gladly. No, 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 I'm okay. But you, you said filming that scene, it hit really close to home, and see, you're emotional about it. Right yeah, now, I mean, I, I haven't. I don't want to cry on live TV, but. Um, yeah, I've been just hearing it now and sitting and listening to it and being in that moment again. It was my last day of filming and I got to go to Rome and, you know, sing this. And it, um, the, the writer of the song, Freddie Wexler, he, I think it's a magical thing when kind of the words and lyrics that you're singing as a character really matches what you're feeling on the inside. And mm -hmm. circumstances are different between me and Mindy, but um, I think just the song being about highs and lows and finding something beautiful in devastation or ruins or heartbreak, um, that what you're hearing there, like the emotion of that was very much from my soul as well as Mindy, so. Well, well thank you for sharing that. Thank I you. I really appreciate that. And you, another transformative um, scene for you in this season were the one where you dance at the Crazy Horse in Paris. It's a, it's a famous Have cabaret. Have you been? Yes. I, I, well, yeah, I've been. <laughs> Why, why are you oh, going to put me on the spot? Yeah, I've been. Yeah, I've been. It was great, no, great but show. But it's like, isn't it like performance art? I've, I've, it's, it is performance I had art. I watched um, their shows, I think, seven times beforehand, and um, they had asked me to come perform as Ashley, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm nervous? scared. But Yes, but then Mindy got to go, and I will say, my the choreographer, Kyle Hanagami, I just did the Mean Girls movie with him, and he's, like, Blackpink's choreographer is amazing. He mm -hmm. was able to, um, with our director, Andy Fleming, figure out how to make kind of a comedic scene and a, like an incredible dance and routine as well. And it was like, to, to cover a Britney Spears song is like big shoes to fill, but I loved, I, me and Lily loved that scene because <laughs> it felt kind of like a reminiscent of Lucille Ball and the, uh, the yeah. physical comedy and we love physical comedy. So that was, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. great. It's, it's a great a, show. It's a beautiful show. It and, is. I mean, it was so scary because these are professional dancers and they were the most gracious girls who were, they were the real crazy horse dancers who were dancing with me. And this, so they did extra rehearsals and I did extra rehearsals and we really got it down pat. So. Well, I'm sure you crushed the dancing. We've heard you sing. You crushed that as well. And you're just crushing it all on the show. So thank you mm -hmm. for being here. So always great to see you. You too. Happy thank you're here. you. And all of Emily in Paris, season four, streaming now, right now, on Netflix. So make sure you check it out. Robin? Right now. But now, <laughs> Dancing with the Stars. It's back tonight, season 33. 33. Can you believe it? The contestants are ready to strut their stuff in the ballroom. We got to go backstage to see them get ready to dance the night away. One of the finalists of season 22, mm. our own Ginger. I remember being there in the ballroom and seeing you in action. Like it was just yesterday. I know. Right? Or nine years ago. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> However we want to look at it. Um, but yes, 13 celebrities now and their partners are getting ready to leave it all on the dance floor. Time to check out their moves as they prepare for tonight's big night. Lights, camera, action. It is time to dance. Are y'all ready to get on the dance? Yeah, you know it. Ooh!
cannot wait for America to see Joey dance! The energy is all the way up with just hours to go until season 33 of Dancing with the Stars begins. I'm excited to show the world what Team Peaches and Cream can do out there in the cha-cha. Fast class, you know, fabulousness, <laughs> fierceness, you know. And, and that's just me, so can you imagine? <laughs> You guys might see the glasses come off. Our team name is Arnold Pommel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to do a backflip. Sasha's going to teach me. She goes, I want to do a backflip. I was like, have you ever done a backflip? No. She's like, no. And I told her to be hard on me. You know, push me to the max. He's at the grocery store just like. Yeah, picking up apples and <laughs> oh, I'll put that on down. The lady's like, wow. The stars rehearsing around the clock. We've done two weeks plus another three rehearsals. So that'd be like six. Times four, times two, 48, add another four hours, plus another, like 56 hours. Wow, that's crazy. Oh my God, I'm, I think I blew out a hip the other day. Yes, <laughs> yes I'm sore. Every, every part of my body is sore. So I had sore toes. I learned a toe stretch. Can you believe that, a toe stretch? What's a toe stretch? Definitely uh, new muscles, feeling new muscles I haven't felt before. And just before showtime. And I'm gonna teach Riley all of my mind tricks to calm our bodies down. This... I'm gonna be praying. <laughs> like, Jesus fixed it and fixed it right now. Do you remember your emotions right before the premiere? I think I had a lot of Jesus fix it and fix it right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the big one. We don't want you to miss mm -hmm. the premiere of Dancing with the Stars tonight at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, right here on ABC and Disney Plus, and then the next day on Hulu. Ava Mendez is here talking about her new children's book. So come on back to GMA. We are back now celebrating Hispanic and Latin American Heritage Month with actress Ava Mendez. She has a new children's book called Desi Mammy and the Never Ending Worries. Welcome, great to see you here. Hi, thank you, George. Tell us about the book. Um, well, it's a buddy story about this little girl named Desi and her brain. And Desi has these never ending worries. Um, I have them as well. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she tries to work with her brain to kind of like, uh, you know, make sure it's not being a bully to her by sending all these negative thoughts her way and that it's being like a BFF to her. And so it's about that relationship. Oh, I am so glad you're doing this. You know, so many kids are dealing with anxiety yeah. right now and that bully brain. In that bully brain, yeah, thank you. It's just one of those things that like, I don't know, once I named it a bully, like that it could, that your brain could be a bully to you, sending you all these crazy thoughts and down a spiral. Um, it helped me deal with my children um, or helped me help them deal with their anxiety. And by naming it and going like, hey, that's not you. Don't believe everything you think. That's not you. That's just your brain on overdrive. And this is available in both English and Spanish? Yeah, it was really important for me. I'm Cuban American. I'm first generation. I made it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, it was very important to me growing up in a very Latin household and speaking Spanish and the whole thing. I was like, we need this. Especially because my parents are so old school. My father and my mother were raised in Cuba. And I asked them, I'm like, did you guys ever like talk to your family. Tough it out. They're like, yeah, exactly. They're like, talk. Oh my God. I'm like, what? So this, I want to open up dialogue and promote conversation. So about what do your daughters it. think about it? Oh, they love it. Um, I think they love it. They're very harsh critics though. Like at first they've seen it in every incarnation, but at first they were just like, mm, mm, and I was like, no, I hear you. They're good. But the other day, George, I got really excited. This is a true story, not a talk show story. This is real. All the stuff we yes. say is real. Yes. Yeah. No, my little girl who just turned 10 was having a hard time. And I swear to you, I walk into her room. She's reading the book. Wow. So I go into, and I'm like, right, crying mom, crying mom, <laughs> crying mom. But anyway, that, that really got to me. Now, is it also true that their interest in Barbie helped in influence Ryan's Ken? A hundred percent. And their disinterest in Ken. We, we, they had so many Barbies. <laughs> it was more their disinterest in Ken. They had like one Ken to like 25 Barbies, no joke. And yeah, it was like, you know, be like, oh, go get your toys. It's time to pick up girls, come on. They'd always leave Ken out there. All their Barbies are like, you know, perfectly placed and Ken would be out in the dirt. So. My girls were too old for Bluey, but I imagine yours must have loved you showing up on an episode of Bluey. Yeah, that was big. <laughs> that was big. I, I was a yoga instructor 
for Aunt Bluey. Thank you for acknowledging that. <laughs> there are no small actors. There are just, uh, what is it, small roles? No. No yeah. small roles. I don't know, something like that. Anyway, I had one line, and it killed in my household. So So you took some time off from acting to help raise uh, your, your children when yeah. they were little. Yeah. You think you're getting back to it? Um, I don't know. If they're, you know, if there's interesting roles. I, I kind of like, I left at a, at a time where, you know, it was also like yeah, 10 years ago. I kind of felt like I did it, you know. I, I was like, I just worked with Ryan Gosling. He's it was like <laughs> the best. And I had such a, I don't know, it was such a high off my career to work with him and what we created together that I was like, this is a good time to like Seinfeld it and just walk out. <laughs> so who knows? Well, a lot of people are going to learn from this book and a lot of people are going to enjoy it. Desi Mammy and the you. Never Ending Worries. Thank you for coming Thank in. Thank you, George. Book is out right now. It's just Tuesday. It was a packed <laughs> show. Yeah. Yeah. What we got going on tomorrow? It's been a great week already.